Hello and welcome to At The 55, your home for OUA football. Me and Tom are back on the mics to set up week eight in the OUA. Tom, uh, you know, we have we have come so far and I like to think we have learned so much, but in many ways, the more we learn, I just always realize the more we don't know about anything. We're going to dive into all these games. We have three teams coming back off the bye that uh, I, I think we have. We're so excited to see where they're at in the late run of games. But more importantly than all of that, as always, Tom, how the heck are you doing? I am doing well, my friend. I am doing well. It is we're coming we're coming to the end of the regular season here and my goodness, what a season it has been so far. And while I am sad to see the regular season end, it just means that we are about to get into playoffs where the best of the best come to play. So we're getting even we haven't even gotten to the really good stuff yet, buddy. Yeah, exactly. It's it, it, it's it's so great. And as we talked about last week, so many of those teams vying for position, the three and threes, two and fours and everything like that really leaves a lot of promise that there'll be some really interesting first round and, and second round games. On that point, real quick, uh, you know, friend of the show, um, stellar play by play man for the Waterloo Warriors, Adam McGuire, um, had commented on um one of our posts, I think, when we posted our week seven pre review podcast, um, because he had kind of raised the proposition or it had responded to our first raising of the proposition of could a three and five team make the playoffs this year? And and he seemed bullish that it could happen. And then I kind of went back being like, I did a little bit of math and I'm really not a math guy. So, like, you know, take that for what it is and didn't think it could happen. So he gave us a little bit of, a, of an update on that. Um, of course, if you're not following us on Twitter, on X or whatever, it's at the 55 podcast. So just at the 55 podcast. Make sure to tune in um, to all our updates there. But so he hit us up um, saying unofficial three and five playoff update. If Western beats Toronto this week, and I'm just going to pause right there, Adam, you're a, a very nice man. I had the pleasure of being in the booth with you, <laughs> obviously, as an employee of Waterloo p- calling these games. I suppose you just felt it in your heart to say it like that. I'm going to just take artistic um credence here and I'm, I'm gonna alter your tweet here when western beats toronto this week we'll have five teams at five plus losses which means at least one three and five team would be guaranteed a postseason uh spot um Then he actually responded, check that Western over Toronto and Queens over Guelph guarantees us at least one three and five team. At this point, it's extremely unlikely to see every five loss team miss. Um, So I I think that's a brilliant dissection of it. And and just once again, to that comment, I want your thoughts on on what our our friend Adam kind of said on that point. I mean, it's just kind of, I guess, just looking at the the facts of it. Seven teams are going to make it. And if this many teams are sitting at five or more losses, well, someone's got to make it. But just once again, if you didn't catch our week seven review podcast, first of all, what are you doing? Um, Mm -hmm. But that isn't a... um, What's the word I'm looking for? That that doesn't speak poorly of where the OUA is at. If anything, I think we're in agreement. And once again, shout out to Ken Waller. And I'm actually going to reference him a bit more specifically after this conversation about uh, Adam. Just speaks to actually how uh, how fruitful we are in the OUA right now. Um, what do you think about um, Mr. McGuire's three and five playoff update he gave us? Yeah, I mean... It really it goes back to what we were saying uh, the last pod that we had when we were talking about the OUA landscape. And on the surface, you might think, oh, my God, like a three and five team is going to get into the playoffs here. Like, blah, blah. But all of these teams are 100 percent deserving and they're going to be vying for that last playoff spot and it's going to be some of the most exciting stuff and now obviously there's a lot of things that need to happen in terms of this week and next week for us to really see where the chips are going to lie but with even just looking at like six down we currently have the ottawa ggs at number six at three and three carlton at seven at two and four and if the season ended right now those two teams would be in but then chomping at their feet you've got Toronto, the Varsity Blues at two and four. Now, 
Best they could do is three and five. I think we've already established yes. that. But still, on their heels, Waterloo Warriors at two and four, and then the McMaster Marauders at two and five, which I think Mac has already kind of played themselves out. But there is a scenario, and if all of the chips align, that could happen still. So really, three teams that are on the outside looking in that with certain things kind of happening here – we could everybody has a, a a potential to make it into the playoffs the only team that is 100 percent eliminated is york everybody else no matter how slim the margin is has an actual chance to get into the playoffs yeah and you know what i i thought that we were going to get away with not talking about york on this podcast or the review podcast of them being on their bye week we actually are going to talk about them very briefly in just a moment because i also just once again want to highlight the fact that as you said right now carlton well, it, it depends on all those all those tie break things because Carlton, Toronto, and Waterloo right now are all at two and four. And that's where, once again, this last stretch of games, because not to get ahead of ourselves, one of the games we are previewing is, of course, Carlton at Waterloo. And, and then uh, there's UFT in Waterloo in the last game of the regular season. So, like, immensely important games. But just taking it face value where they do have Carlton um, and maybe it's just based on the alphabetical Carlton and Toronto and Waterloo, but just assuming that that's the case for whatever reason, that first round game is Carlton at Laurier. Huh. How did that go when we saw it earlier in the season? I believe it was a 20 to 15 win for the Golden Hawks. Now, have they certainly gotten better in, in Laurier? Absolutely. But I think the same can be said about Carlton and just having that swagger going into their house. And frankly, I will say as well, Tom, that looking at the standings, if the season ended right now, you and me are making a trip to Windsor to see the, oh, my G's take yeah, on your Lancers. Are, are if you that, kidding? Oh, I, <laughs> not even in the slightest. Um, but but let's pivot, though. As we said, so once again, shout out to Adam McGuire um, at uh, Adam McG1983 uh, uh, on Twitter, on X uh, for some good uh, OUA. And I think he does some OHL coverage as well, um, but just some good uh, sports takes in there. And just once again, just tune into Waterloo games. Um just to hear one of the better broadcasts you will get in the league. But we had a couple comments about York over the last couple weeks. And, and obviously, I, I think it was coming off of week six where I, I let us down a bit of a, um, a gnarly path um, in talking about York in some less than pleasant terms that though it kind of broke the rule that you often – uh, remind us of that if you don't have anything nice to say you don't say nothing at all and we really took that to heart last week when we broke down the battle of toronto argo cup red and blue bowl because i just don't think we actually said anything about york Mm-mm. um but he- here's the deal uh you know uh, a friend of the show uh super oua fan ken waller uh raised the question i'll read it verbatim Drawing on your experience, and this was directed to to Tom and I, drawing on your experience both as players and as coaches, what's the sports psychology approach for the York Lions as the 23 season debacle comes to a close? Focus on lessons learned, press reset, hope no one noticed. (laughs) And uh, I made the mistake of closing the other tab I had open, but we also had a couple comments over the last few episodes do you have them in front of you, Tom? Yes, sir. Yes, Beautiful. sir. I and do. just as, and as a setup, these are comments from our YouTube feed. And if you if you are just been tuning into the podcast, if you if you've missed us mentioning this, we do put the episodes up on YouTube, uncut, unedited, unfiltered for the sometimes two plus hours straight <laughs> that we go to see our uh, our beautiful mugs uh, jibber jabber about all things OBA football. But yeah, so on this discussion that Ken brought up. What did we have um, on the YouTubes? Yeah, so I'll I'll highlight one comment in particular here, but it was really interesting to note. Yes, we had talked about earlier, if you don't have anything nice to say, you shouldn't say anything at all. And that's kind of the approach that we took until you rightfully brought up the fact, <laughs> hey, you know what? No, we've, we've avoided these guys for a, enough time here. We need to talk about this. This is not okay. And we did what we did. The comment starts off with, Thank you, thank you, thank you for the comments of the York football program or lack of program. I couldn't agree with you more knowing that the facilities uh, they have are probably the best in the OUA, but the program is the worst with not one coach that has ever had success prior and current. How are you to build a program if you don't even know what success looks like? I have thought this for years that the OUA needs these two Toronto schools to be competitive and 
need to be held accountable and you guys have done it here bravo pat on the back uh keep it up and maybe one day york who is the third largest university in the country and in brackets have lots of funds Mm -hmm. might care and show they care about this football program and actually build something any great coaches should want the york job as if you get this team to even four and four you would be seen as a god and so the one thing that you know obviously lots of uh, common themes in that to what Ken had kind of asked us about as well. But it seems like a lot of the York faithful are sick and tired of not talking about this, of not bringing up the problem that, hey, what's happening at York right now is not okay. And if you're going to be a part of the OUA, you need to be held to a higher standard. And that's on, at this point, it's on the university. You fired Warren Craney previously. You need to get somebody in there who knows what they're doing and is that great coach. That's my two cents. And there was one more comment that actually I believe raised some points that our our friend Deshaun uh, with Mm -hmm. his um, company Persevere brought up as far as not just York, but kind of extending into well into Waterloo a bit as well, but specifically maybe just highlighting the point that uh, once again this this commenter in referencing Persevere's work once again shout out to Deshaun Stevens um, mm-hmm. about York and Toronto. Maybe we just lean into that aspect of the comment. Certainly, and uh, this comment here once again re- referencing everything that Deshaun did. And if you're not following him, you should absolutely follow him as well. Persevere podcast, he's great at what he does. I was shocked to see this from Persevere that U of T has not had a winning season for 28 years. Waterloo was even more shocking as it has been 25 years and they had Trey Ford as a quarterback. How did they not have a winning season with the best quarterback? And York has been 21 years. This is very surprising, isn't it? Yeah. So here's what we're thinking we've already taken up a good chunk of time and knowing us we'll be going into that two hour mark likely just talking about the games that we have over the years whether it was me and eddie off the jump two toronto guys me and dakota being two toronto guys nate being a mississauga guy having interest in that and you just being an absolute sicko with you know oua football and canadian (laughs) football just in general we've obviously talked a lot about toronto football both in sort of the grassroots level and at the university level, the where players out of Toronto and going. So we literally kind of just came up with this in our little pre-pod meeting that we had and wanted to figure out how to address these things. Because frankly, reading Ken's question kind of floored both of us. Bravo to you, Ken. That's a, an incredible question that deserves more time than I think we want to just try to come up with here and now. So what we kind of talked about wanting to do is in the off season, um, we we both and I, I certainly being from Toronto and being in Toronto right now and coaching at the high school level here currently want to get in touch with people that we know who are either recently been involved with these programs where uh, you know I get you know U of T did have that that fun little run w- with Clay Sakara specifically that 2019 season I believe it was even York in 2018 with um, uh, the the Hunchacks uh, in, in in Brett and Colton um, mm-hmm. and, and some other incredible pieces on that team but just overall you know that the 28 years for U of T the, the whole piece on York being such a an, an abysmal of a program yet they send so many guys to combines into the league but then also getting people that you know a bit more historically have been in those programs when they were sort of at a higher level of uh, success or having more success so we want to put that together maybe it'll be a series of episodes depending on just you know obviously we can get so long-winded I'm sure we'd have a million questions for the types of people and I already have kind of a list going in my head of people that would be great to kind of get on with that so that's what we're going to do. So, you know, if you're listening to this, watching to this, and you have any ideas to sort of support that or, or that things that you think would work well with that, we kind of want to do a sort of Toronto football, state of Toronto football, maybe mini series of podcasts, mm-hmm. and maybe we'll add some video component and stuff like that. Like I said, this is an idea that we've we've certainly talked about doing for a while, but just in the wake of these great comments and questions that we've been getting from some of our comments about uh, more so York, but you know, obviously Toronto as well being a bit of a disappointment this year, though of course they 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 do still have this opportunity to to make it into the playoffs this year, which would be fantastic. Um, 
Yeah, so that's what we're thinking about all that. Tom, anything um, I might not have mentioned in that or any other comments just about that sort of uh, this sort of very nascent idea we're, we're piecing together right now? Yeah, I think um, the real main point and also something I, I want to quickly shout out as well, um, not having winning seasons means being above 500 because well, those Waterloo right. teams and that, those Toronto teams got the four and four, but that's you're breaking even. You're not winning season so that's what that stat means just to 100 percent clear that out but yeah i don't think that we can just take you know with how in-depth you and i like to get just on normal week to weeks here to really break down toronto football and what the status of everything there is i think it really needs its own podcast devoted to it so that you and i can really dive into our thoughts on it get some uh, um, some other people as well so um, that's what we're going to be doing that'll be some off-season content certainly and um, we should get into uh, uh the games this week because like you said we are going to take two hours at this point <laughs> most certainly so let's jump into it and we'll start with the first of the four one o'clock games we have and uh going back to speaking of our friend adam mcguire we're starting in the game that he will be calling so brilliantly make sure to be tuning into that one or at least if you're tuning into multiple ones maybe that's the one that you you have the audio on for it's the carlton ravens taking the trip to the kw to take on the waterloo warriors as we were saying for perhaps a couple weeks now and even in our little setup based on the question of the comment that Adam raised this game is is massive just to reiterate the point these are two teams currently sitting at two and four and to add on to that they are playing in their final weeks likely teams still in and around that same record that they'll be at um coming off of this week so picking up this win is just that much more important because head-to-heads and things like that and common opponents is are a number of the factors that do play in um to all these to all these tie break situations tom i want to start from the waterloo standpoint when we look at this game because this is a team that like our consistent comment about them all year pretty much has been how impressive they've been at committing to the run game they dropped this game on the road last week to your Marauders in Hamilton, uh, where it, it felt like they kind of went away from the run game. They kind of went away from their bread and butter. You brought up that great point of that they're a gap scheme run team, and you know the Ryan leaders of the world on that Matt D line were giving them a lot of trouble, where they weren't having time to develop those plays and everything of that nature. On the flip side, we talked about this Carlton defense being one that plays with a tremendous amount of speed. So where I want to go with on this one is with Waterloo now being in a situation where they very much fumbled their opportunity to, to truly control their destiny. You know, they could still win out and make it into the playoffs at four and four. After all, from what we talked about with Adam's comment, if a five loss team is going to make it the playoffs, if Waterloo gets to four and four, it's almost a sure thing that they will get in. Do you see them going back to their bread and butter of, of the run game? knowing that they're playing a defense that might present similar challenges to their specific style of run game in Carlton as Mac did the week prior. Yeah, this is going to be a very strong test for this Waterloo offense and specifically for this offensive line here. You talk about their bread and butter being that power run game. You've got (laughs) on Yucca on one side who, if, uh, if we don't see a lineman of the year coming out of the University of Windsor, I think we see a lineman of the year coming out of the University of Carleton or Waterloo at this point. Oh, so there is uh, plug your ears, Queens. My goodness, <laughs> but there is uh, I, he is for sure, in my opinion, anyways, lining up to be an All Canadian this 100%. year on Yeka. He is he's just playing lights out, and then. Obviously, anytime you do a run play, but specifically with man, you really need to create some space and you need to get people moved. And uh, Mr. Michael Lightbody is not a light body and he is very <laughs> difficult to move. So uh, at, at a power run game, that's going to be a very, very tough challenge for this Waterloo offensive line just to begin with. And then you obviously look at all of the amazing athletes that they have on that defense as well. So this is going to be very tough. I think I think if you're looking at this, despite knowing that 
the strength of that Carlton defense, and not to take away from anybody else, but the strength of it is on that defensive line. I think you still have to commit to that run game. It's what you've been doing the best. It's how you've kind of been winning here. And honestly, if any uh, Waterloo coaches, if Coach Brendan Conway, offensive coordinator from Waterloo, is uh, listening here, he's my he, little uh, tidbits for he you. He certainly is. <laughs> if you're running power, if you're running counter, you have to run it at Onyeka. You can't run away from him. Because he's too fast, he's too strong, he will chase it down every time. The best way to deal with an absolute stud of a defensive lineman is to run directly at them. At least you have your main point of attack, your main blocking scheme dedicated to that best player. And then you have the best possibility to try to get them out of the way or at least tie them up so that you can get some yardage downfield. If you run away from Onyeka, he will chase you down. If you try to ignore him or you don't take any uh, necessary precautions as well, he's going to be a nightmare for you all game. If they very much do that, Tom and they might have been planning to do that regardless. Maybe they aren't tuning in. I, I have on pretty good authority, that authority being a lot of the coaches at Waterloo. They do enjoy our content. And thank you again so much to the great people of the Waterloo community and, of course, on that Warrior staff. Um, and then if they proceed to lose as a result of it, I am clipping you saying that and posting it, tagging them, tagging on Yekka, tagging uh. Carlton, tagging just, you know, the, the, everyone and anyone on that. But tying into that, um, this theme of Waterloo's rushing attack, because for Carlton, despite that proficiency they have on their defensive line, um, and just, I mean, once again, I mean, you, you mentioned some of those other names of possible standout um, uh, uh, defensive uh, or lineman of the year type award winners. And like just once again, speaking to the depth of talent we have. And of course, you alluded to Tyson Hergott. We'll certainly get to him in a moment. Going back to last week, right? We see Carlton get, you know, run over. And I use that turn of phrase intentionally the way that Queens did move the ball on them. And, and of course, Queens very much in their post Vrekin. Uh, you know, string of games, and we still don't have an update on that. Uh, uh, his status, that is, has very much been like, well, we can run the ball as good as anyone, whether Vrekin's in or not. We need to win games at this point because of some of those tough games we lost. Let's just really lean into that aspect of our game. And they rushed for something like, I forget it was, like 360 yards or some pretty gaudy number. Queens, I believe, is sitting first in the league in rush yards. Waterloo used to hold that title. That like 80-something they rushed against Mac really bumped them down a little bit, but they're still sitting in fourth. Along with that, they're third to Queens in terms of time of possession, which kind of goes part and parcel with that. But as a result of their... So on the one hand, right? Queens as, as you know, the top-running team, but Waterloo being, you know, in the mix with them. Queens showing last week they could really run the ball on Carlton. But for whatever reason it was that Waterloo went away from their running attack against against McMaster, it really was the first game where we saw them, you know, put the ball uh, in the hands of Nick Orr, you know, metaphorically speaking, to say, "All right, son, go win us a game, right?" And and, mm-hmm. and I am pulling the numbers up right here. He goes fourteen to twenty six for one hundred and seventy yards. Two interceptions, no touchdowns, right? And, you know, yes, you mentioned how great that defensive line is. You know, Onyeka and Mr. Michael, not so light body. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, we're former offensive linemen. We can make these comments. We're allowed to make these jokes. (laughs) I'm not so light body right now, so. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, you still have on the back end, you know, guys like Ottman Braun, guys like Louis Laveau, guys like uh, Igamudo, Zendra Dan, right? that will certainly make any quarterback's life difficult, Mm -hmm. let alone a guy like Nick Orr, who's, I believe, just in his second year and has so far not really been asked to win Waterloo games. As we've kind of mentioned, on the flip side to what Caban did last year, and of course we saw Caban come and lay in the game and actually look really nice, though maybe it's what you would have called garbage time, so whatever. Um In contrast to what Caban did last year where it's like, yeah, he got big yards for them, but at the cost of throwing a lot of interceptions. Of course, they still had Gordon Lamb last year too. So it's Mm -hmm. one thing when you have Evan Basiliga, or sorry, James Basiliga. You do have Evan Basiliga. No shots (laughs) at him, but James is the better player. But when you have James, but then you also have Gordon Lamb, it's kind of like, well, we'd be silly not to throw the ball much more. 
So I guess I see all that in saying that Carlton, we really do like their defense. They got gashed in the run against Queens. We're seeing Waterloo come off a game that they went away from that. Now, add and, and I'm in agreement with you, I do think they will go back to that run game, attack on Yeka, really try to tire him out a little bit as a result of that. Then maybe when you do have to pass, he's maybe not as uh, f- firing off the ball as much as he might be, or maybe you're just pissing him off and he's that much more wanting to fire off the ball when you, he does see that offensive line drop back. But the more so the point I'm bringing up right now is that, like I said, we saw Nick Orr ha- have not, not so great a performance. First and foremost, I certainly believe he's still going to be the quarterback that trots out there for the first snap on offense for them. I see you shaking your head for our, or in agreement for our podcast listeners. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I certainly gather that you agree with me on that one. What do you make of maybe what his level of, because you know, obviously regardless of how well they run it, they'll, they'll have to throw the ball a little bit. If you were to kind of give a confidence meter of of where young Mr. Orr is, where he not just has this 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 bad performance, but then he also sees the guy who, and I believe they're in the exact same like recruiting class, him and Caban, mm-hmm. coming late in that game and and actually look really good, albeit for just five passes. Because you know even the best running teams, quarterback still kind of matters a little bit. So from that standpoint, like where does that factor into your thoughts about where Waterloo's offense is against Carlton? I think when you look at, well, first and foremost, as any offense, if you want to be successful in the OUA, you have to be able to pass. It's just, you have to be able to. And that, that's not a hot take. That's not, oh my God, Tom's hitting us with some some crazy stuff. No, that's just facts. I think if you're Nick or his passing may not have been the best against McMaster, but his athleticism and the things that he did on the ground were also a a positive note. There was a lot of times where he took off and ran. He got a couple of first downs and he was doing some great things with his feet there. Now, still the numbers that he had, like you said, 14 for 26, 107 and two picks. That's not exactly something to write home about. And especially, you know, you look at, all of the difficulties that he would have faced throughout this entire game, (laughs) excuse me. And Nolan Caban comes in for their last possession. He goes five for five, 76 yards and a touchdown. Now, if you're Nick Orr, it's not exactly the greatest way to end off a game, getting pulled and then seeing the backup who also was the former starter, go down and do something against McMaster when you had hadn't been able to do it all game yourself. So I think at the best he might be a little a little shaken here. I mean, on the year so far, he has three touchdown passes and four interceptions. He's also been sacked 10 times. Mm. So that's something else that I'm sure is coming into play here as well for him. And there's a lot of different things that are happening at one point. Knowing that they're going to go into this mindset in this game, looking at, okay, look at this pass rush for, for Carlton. It is legit. All of the bodies that they have on defense. I think he's, he's going to be... He's not going to be super comfortable, but I still think he's going to have confidence. I still think that Nick Orr, um, while you know maybe not having the best showing, I still think that he is the guy for uh, for Waterloo. I don't think that he's played himself out of it yet, despite what we saw from Caban at the last um, the last drive. Like I said, and I think that he's he's got something to him. So maybe he's a little nervous going into this one. Now suddenly these final two games for them are incredibly important, like you've kind of detailed, but. I still think that he has confidence going into this game. Let's flip the script now, though. Let's look at what Carlton's bringing on the uh, on their offensive side of the table. First and foremost, you know Tristan Lefebvre. I mean, and you, you highlighted it when we talked about them coming off their loss to Queens. You know, they're, they're sitting at two and four right now. The only wins against the Toronto teams. But of course, as we said, in that kind of extended conversation about kind of where they're at in contrast to last year and just how they're building with Coach Grant and everything like that, that it still looks to be on a positive trajectory and everything like that. And Tristan Lefebvre, despite maybe slowing down a little bit in the last couple of games, and hey, you talk talk about the pressure that that Orr was under. I mean, Lefebvre's taken some hits against Queens, Um, you know. The, the mm. Hubert, Newell, and Van Wisher connection just like causing him fits all game long. But nonetheless, he's still, I think, in the third or fourth spot of, of yards per game passing 
Obviously, that's a product of the system as much as his own talents, even though they've kind of developed this kind of two-headed running back attack with Ferguson and with Gale and everything of that nature. We've seen Waterloo get, though, kind of beat up in a couple of games now of teams, albeit some really good passing teams, but they have moved the ball in the air against them. Once again, even going back to that Windsor game where Windsor really seemed to take the opportunity to say, you know, or going against a team, you know, an inferior opponent, if, if you're calling a spade a spade, let's really see if we can get Danny Skelton going. And and they did, right? At, at, obviously, that gives, you know, the Tyson Hergots of the world the opportunity to just get in his stance and fire off the ball. But you add an extra little double team there, maybe you slow him down. But Lefebvre's another guy where he has all these weapons. Obviously, we've talked about, you know, the Hatchies, the Browns, the Reddies, and of course, our guy, uh, Fernand. Of course, you know, shout out to Kasim Fernand because I saw on the, uh, Carlton's social media today that I guess in the Queens game, he surpassed the 1,000 yard mark in his career for receiving yards, oh, which yeah. is he's a kid in his third year. And of course, worth noting, his rookie year was a two game shortened season mm-hmm. because of COVID mm-hmm. restrictions and everything like that. Um, but nonetheless, from what we've seen with Waterloo defensively, how we've seen teams move the ball against them, you know, Tyson Hergott is the definition of like when you call someone a problem and it's a young Carlton offensive line um, who had a little trouble with a, a great pass rushing team in Queens last week and just how Carlton lose the ball in the air so effectively. What are your thoughts from that standpoint of this matchup? Certainly. You know, we talked so much about on Yeka on the Carlton side. You got to make sure you are looking after Mr. Tyson Hergott. I mean, everything that he's done this year has certainly warranted that. But you even look at last year against this team. Waterloo played against Carlton. Now, Carlton came away with that one. But Tyson Hergott finished with eight tackles, one sack, and three tackles for loss. So in the backfield, pretty damn consistently. And even if it doesn't show up on the stat page, you know that he was disrupting things, changing the way that uh, people like Tanner DeYoung wanted to throw at that time. And um, I think he's he's going to be the same the same thing here. He's he's definitely going to be something to watch. And like you said, this is a young Carlton offensive line that's seen some pretty damn good players and done a pretty good job. But you got to make sure that you're looking after Mr. Tyson Hergott here. I think if you're Tristan Lefebvre and you are specifically looking at the kinds of plays that you've been running and the um, the split that typically Carlton has between the run and the pass, you're definitely going to be more of a pass-heavy team here. I think Waterloo's strength when it comes to defense is in stopping the run versus stopping the pass. So already you're kind of spelling things out for carlton as being favorable in this game but you have to make sure you're accounting for tyson hergott like we've talked about the sacks we've talked about the tackles for loss the dude has a few pass breakups this year as well and i believe he's got an interception or two on the season as well so he's he's a problem pretty much all over the field here and you have to account for him and now there's other bodies on that carl or the sorry the waterloo defense as well certainly but uh if there's a focal point to look at it'd be number nine Absolutely. Tom, I'm pretty much at the end of my, my commentary on this. I, I, what you brought up there, uh, you know, it, it really does remind me, and I, I use the turn of phrase that, you know, we often use in boxing, the end of our last podcast of styles make fights. And I just love that we have so many matchups this year where that seems to be the case where, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily an overwhelming favorite of just one team being so dominant. And that's why we see it's like this team beat, th- beat this team, but that team beat that team who beat mm-hmm. that team mm-hmm. that you're kind of like the law, the transitive property of whatever a beat C and a B <laughs> a beats a, B and B beat C, but C beats a, then what do you make of any of it? Um, that's called a filibuster because I'm still in many ways torn about this one. So I'm going to so graciously, as the kind soul I am, give you first pick in this game. Tom, who are you taking with the Ravens on the road against the Waterloo Warriors? Well, looking at this matchup here, just looking at the pieces that they have on both sides, I think Carlton comes away with this one. I think that they are better suited offensively to go against this Waterloo defense. And I think for as much faith that I think Nick Orr should have in himself I don't think he's he's there yet in order to like you perfectly said win football games for this squad here I think that Carlton comes out light body on you and on Yeka really do a number on that rush game and they overwhelm Nick Orr in the air uh this is going to go to Carlton on the road I, you know what and that's the exact way that 
someone who's going to pick Carlton breaks it down for all those reasons that we talked about. And had you picked Waterloo, I might have given the exact same reason that I'd be picking Carlton. But let's make it interesting, my friend, because you know what? I'm going to give you the breakdown on why Waterloo's taking this one Hell yeah. at home because they're going to get that rushing game going. They realized they went away from the well for whatever reason it was, whether it was a product of something McMaster did to change up their schemes. They know that's where they've had success. They realize that's where they faltered. Lefebvre is going to be dropping back in the pocket. This is a young offensive line that is perhaps dealt with no one nearly as good. Well, I shouldn't say no one nearly as good, but I've dealt with few pass rushers as good with what number nine is going to be given them for the Waterloo Warriors. Waterloo is going to dominate the time of possession. They're going to force Carlton into some three and into second and long situations. And, you know, I think Carl uh, Waterloo is going to come up with some big plays on defense. And at the end of the day, I think this is going to be a, a, a very competitive game. But, you know, I think that there's a great argument on both sides of the ball. And like I said, had it not been for you spelling out the Carlton uh, uh, side of it, which I, I won't even argue against. I'll just say, well, here's the Waterloo side of things, and and let's make it interesting to see uh, to see what happens Love with it. that one. Let's move to our other one o'clock game, and and though, like I said. You should, of course, have the audio on. Actually, uh, but it's at Laurier, so that probably means our guy Jack Moore is on it. Uh, yeah, no, but in fairness, I'll stick with my original comment. Have your audio rocking for our guy Adam McGuire, but on the larger of your screen, since we do have four one o'clock games going, which once again, if you're sickos like Tom and me, means that you're watching them all at once. The <laughs> larger of your screen is going to, unless you have a specific reason to be tuning into any of these other games if all things being equal is for our next game which is the Windsor Lancers also in the KW taking on that team down the street from Waterloo in the Laurier Golden Hawks Windsor coming off the bye having just dropped that game at home to Western in what was one of the most entertaining games of the season perhaps second only to the Panda game or perhaps, you know, second or, or third to the Windsor Ottawa game. Ottawa's in a lot of exciting games this year. <laughs> that game against Waterloo at the start of the season was really yeah. exciting as well. Laurier, of course, coming off of a win at Ottawa, a very exciting game in its own right um, for so many reasons. And, and both those teams are so exciting. This is a game that, it, that like we are right in the sweet spot of the schedule that we've been talking about for all these matchups that we had in week seven, even a couple in week six. There's a couple we know coming up in week nine and right here in week eight. This is the matchup that, that we've been eyeballing for so many reasons. Uh, Tom, you know, I know your life isn't complete when the Windsor Lancers aren't <laughs> on the field of action, even less so. Or when they are a bit more diminished, when when your American son, the pride of Flint, Michigan, <laughs> Joey Zorn, isn't playing, which the last two games we saw for them, which include that nice win at home against a banged-up Queens team, um, he wasn't there. What are your thoughts off the jump when you compare and contrast these two teams, whether taking into account wins or coming off the bye or any any aspect you want to? I'll give you the opportunity to set the table with this one. I have been... I, I'm smiling so much at this game that my cheeks are starting to hurt. I have been looking forward to this matchup since like week two when you and I realized just how damn good both of these teams are in the OUA yeah. this year. Oh my God, it's finally here. Laurier Windsor. Woo! <laughs> when you look at these two teams, man, oh my goodness, do you see some raw power and talent on both sides of the ball for both of these squads here. You look back at last year, and last year this was a, a very decent game as well. Now, obviously, Laurier really comes away with this one. Final score is 49-11, to 11, but they have a monster second quarter where Laurier goes off and they score 28 points. But the thing to remember here is passing for these Windsor Lancers, Carter Zinger and Josh Sim. Mm. Our boy Skelton didn't even play in this last game. And I think he's showcased that he is far and above the best quarterback option that Windsor has. So I think that this passing offense goes a lot better than it did last game uh, for Windsor here. Obviously, looking at Joey Zorn, he is 
one of the biggest, if not the focal point on that offense. You need to have him back, especially if you want to get into the playoffs. And here's hoping that he is healthy because a league that has Joey Zorn in it is just a better league in general. But he's had three weeks now to be completely off. He didn't play in Western. He didn't play in Queens. And he didn't obviously didn't play last week because that was a bye week. So three weeks off, re- resting, rehabbing. This is probably going to be his best opportunity to come back and to play. And certainly, you know, if you're going up against York or you're going up against another team that's you you really should beat, if you're kind of on the fence a little bit with an injury, yeah, you know what, we probably got this without me. I'll sit this one out, whatever. But this is Laurier. This is big-time football you know that if there's a chance in hell for either of these squads, if they've got injuries, if you're ready to go, you're playing in this one. This has got huge playoff inf- implications already. And if Windsor wants any hope to try and get back to that number one seed, and obviously that takes Lori beating Western next week and a whole three-way tie and points for and against, and I don't know if they're already out of that, whatever, but you need to win this game if you want to better playoff positions and and all of that fun stuff yeah and you know and i think that's a like that's a really important point because one way or the other both of these teams are going to have a minimum of six wins Mm -hmm. because if you haven't looked ahead or if you haven't heard us talk about already windsor finishes up their season against york so if they drop this game they'll end up six and two they'll be in third place Almost a sh- yeah, they will be in third place because at the very worst, Laurier will be seven and one, or you have Western at seven and one. So for Windsor, them losing this game puts them in third with a bullet. It gets very interesting then, and we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but just kind of thinking of that 3D chess, if you will. Mm. For Laurier, you lose this game. If you lose this game, then you have to go to Western and all of a sudden that becomes a situation where, okay, if you play your A game against Western, you pull off that win, then you and Western are seven and one to Windsor's six and two. But then the tie break might be as simple as, I don't know, we're gonna, I'm getting a bit over my skis and I feel like I let us down a bad path there. My apologies. I don't know where I was going with that. But I guess it's perhaps of worth noting that for Windsor, you lose this game, you have third place. And just, I guess, the idea that this game, though you mentioned that game last year, which I believe was in Windsor, correct? Mm -hmm. And for all the reasons you said that this is a better Windsor team, it's worth noting, it's a better Laurier team as well. Windsor getting a home field game is perhaps as big a component, as big an advantage as any team has, other than, of course, the Ottawa region teams in this one. Let's talk, though, about that, that quarterback that, that we have for uh, the Windsor Lancers. Because obviously, as you mentioned, in, in, spec- in direct comparison to uh, uh, Josh Shim. And, and the other quarterback whose name I forget, you mentioned Danny Skelton. Yeah, by, by and far, heads and shoulders above where they're at. And we talk about the importance of that bye week, not just for getting Joey Zorn off whatever ailment he's been having, but in many ways too. For Skelton, you know, we go back to that game against Western wasn't his best outing. Even that the, the big win against Queens, it's a 29-5 to final score. Remember, two of those touchdowns for Windsor were pick sixes that they scored Mm -hmm. wasn't a great outing for him in that one either really his last best game we have to go back to that shootout and you know it's 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 a shootout by OUA standards but 42 31 victory is you know I I think worth calling it a shootout but Mm -hmm. the game in Ottawa he goes 24 for 32 286 two touchdowns one interception and it still doesn't you know those aren't Algersma numbers those aren't you know those aren't top of the league, and he hasn't been there at the top of the league. Obviously, that's not what Hillock's been doing and everything like that. And, you know, That's kind of maybe in that Tristan Lefebvre category. We've seen him against some of the best defenses in Western and Queens, and he's faltered. What do you think for just Windsor's offense in general? And I guess we have to frame it in almost two questions, kind of the if Zorin's there and if he's not there, where 
with Windsor's offense, specifically in their passing game. Because as we said, in contrast to him and Hillock, Hillock's been able to this year use his passing ability to set up that run game as if they even really need setting up. Mm -hmm. It feels like Skelton needs that run game there to make his job that much easier and opening up a lot of things in the passing game. And he does have a lot of great receivers out there. Like I've really liked Shane Johnson this year, going back to that Waterloo game, Mm -hmm. specifically Cunningham. Obviously we remember the incredible punt return against Western Colby Jen Thrasher, Moa, all these guys, Liam Talbot, of course, but do you feel like if Zorn isn't there, I guess this is how I'll frame it. If Zorn's not there, and we know that means their running game will take a step back. As good as you know, Christopher Johns and the Wibby Mambas and Liam Talbots of the world are, it kind of feels like that's the story. Because I just don't know if they get enough juice from their run game to provide Skelton with the assistance in terms of just how that can influence a defense to allow him to have success. Because we certainly know if they're going to beat Laurier, they need to have their run game and their pass game humming. Certainly. You need to be on the top of your game if you want to be able to beat Laurier, especially going into Waterloo to do that. When you look at the past couple of games for Mr. Danny Skelton, now he's played against some damn good defenses in Queens and in Western, but in Queens, he goes 10 for 18, 131 yards, one touchdown, one pick. And then you look over at the Western game, 18 for 35, 237, but two interceptions. When you're playing against these top defenses who know how to, at the very least, affect the run game, if not outright stop it, and you're missing your top runner in Joey Zorn, there's a whole lot more pressure that goes on Mr. Skelton now. And despite the fact that I think he has the components to do it, it still comes down to what have you seen before? How are you going to react to this? Is it something that you're you're used to? Now, obviously... We've talked about it many times, but last year's playoff game against Ottawa was really Danny Skelton's coming out party, and he showcased the stuff that he did, and he was really great in that. But I don't think that we've seen that level of performance yet this year. I think, once again, the having the bye week going into this, Windsor is going to be the best prepared that they could possibly be going up against a very good Laurier squad who, while yes, they played a game last week, also was on a bye week the previous week. So both of these squads are going to be damn near 100% or at least as close as you can get with week eight in the OUA season. And man, this is going to be a great game. Now, what I will say is if Joey Zorn is not in the lineup, like from a system wise, I don't know how much that, that changes your offensive game plan. I still think that Christopher John is good enough to run a lot of the same plays that you would use with Joey Zorn. I just think that you should be looking at potentially, you know, gaining six or seven yards versus the nine or 10 that you might with Joey Zorn. Six or seven yards on first down is still a hell of a thing to do, but that's something to keep in, in mindset here. And maybe Lee and Talba gets a little bit more involved in that game. But certainly if Joey Zorn is not in this one, you need a lot more from Danny Skelton if you want to see a win here. Well, and I and I th- and I, I certainly agree. I don't think that their game plan necessarily changes. I just think that how that influences the way that the defense certainly you know plays you is certainly the factor in that. But let's let's stick on the theme of defenses. But let's let's flip the script right now, though, because as we said, that Queens game, Western with Windsor's offense. It certainly that might have been their weakest output of the game. I think despite only the 10 points against Western, I felt like their offense, I had, I felt better about their offense in that game. I agree. The Queens game that they really faltered. Queens is one of the best defenses up there in the OU way, but I don't believe I'm going to give them the title of the best defense in the OU way. Cause who holds that title? Mr. Tom Sterling. Uh, that would be those Western Mustangs. Oh, is it Western right now? Okay. Well then, <laughs> all right. Fine. It's Western. Yeah, there you go, folks. Western's really good at football. Here we are. We're saying it. Western, they're great. They play offense great. They play defense great. Their special te- ah, the special teams have been a few point- points. They might need to clean that up. A la Javoni Cunningham. But Windsor is, you know, no chop liver either when it comes to playing defense. And, you know, it's not even you know, sometimes we see teams, as we've talked about, where 
they're really good in the back end, but maybe you can run it on them. Or they're really stout in the box, but then you can throw it on them deep and everything like that, or just get your uh, your yards through the air. With them, it, it's tough sledding whichever way you go. Now, this is a brilliant game where it's a classic something's gotta give because on the one hand, I don't think that Windsor is gonna hold uh, Laurier to what Windsor's passing average they're giving up is. Actually, then you know what? I, I, I it might be Windsor as the top defense out here. Actually, yeah, I'm gonna say Windsor. Windsor's defense is is, is top is at top of the pile. But I neither think Windsor is gonna hold uh, Mr. Taylor Elgersma to 164 yards, which is what they're holding teams to. Which of course includes Evan Hillock. Not 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 that that was his, but his his outage in their game was part of the mix for them. But I also don't think that Taylor is getting his 323 that he's averaging. From that spectrum or 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 maybe one of those does happen. Of course, like it very well like you know the, 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 one of those could happen, right? Or, or one of the, could exceed those numbers. I have a hunch it'll probably make its way one way in the middle. If you are in agreement with me and of course if you're not to heck with you. <laughs> I kid of course, I love you, but in that idea that like those as pretty incredible like signposts of on the one hand the I believe the lowest amount of passing yards given up by a defense in Windsor and on the other hand the most passing yards averaged by any one quarterback in the idea of that being a spectrum where the result of this game will be somewhere in the middle do you have it as no Taylor is still getting his he's getting his 320 whatever or 330 whatever no, Windsor's going to shut him down. They're getting after the, the, you know, they're getting after the quarterback. Kaladi's well rested. You know, our our guy Mufta is saying his Mufta heck out of my way, and I'm going <laughs> to take down Mr. Elgersma. Or is it somewhere in the middle? And if it's in the middle, is it smack dab in the middle, or does it lean one way or the other? In that aspect of this game, what are some of your thoughts? Because to me, that's one of the most fascinating things here. Maybe second to whether Joey Zorn's playing. Couldn't agree with you more. And just taking a look at, um, you know, the the things that Taylor Algersma has done so far this year, it's really impressive. The year so far, he is leading in most of the major categories, certainly in yards per game at 323 yards, like you said. Touchdowns just right behind Evan Hillock, who is uh, also pretty damn good as well. But, you know, you, you, you look at... All of the amazing things that Windsor has been able to do defensively here. And certainly for as good as the Windsor offense can be, that Windsor defense is just unbelievable. The sacks that they have been getting, the turnovers and everything has just been outstanding to kind of see. And with that Laurier offensive line that has had some struggles with injuries and has some struggles with uh, with a few things, I think that this is going to be easily the biggest test so far for this Laurier offense. Now, when it comes to Taylor Elgersma, he's obviously showcased the abilities that he can do and going off and having like 12 touchdown passes in two games. But those two games were against York and they were against Guelph when they really had a uh, a struggle at, on defense. Let's just put that lightly there. Now, Taylor is still a hell of a player. Don't get me wrong. He is uh, one of, if not the best quarterback kind of in the OUA. It's between him and Hillock. So, um, but there's there's a lot of different factors into this game. I still think Taylor is going to showcase he is one of, if not the best quarterback in the OUA right now, and he's going to have some success. I don't think it's going to be 300 yards, though. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. If I have to lean one way, it's going to be a little bit more towards Taylor going off and kind of doing his thing because he is that good and he's got some outstanding receivers to throw to, but he's not going to see the same amount of success that he normally does. And, and I'm certainly in agreement. I, I, I won't necessarily stake my, my, my claim on just what that will be because I think another aspect that could lead to his numbers being reduced is that in that Ottawa game, which by the numbers and, you know, maybe we're inconsistent. Sometimes maybe we lean into the numbers more and sometimes we do the eye test thing more. And when it comes to Ottawa's defense, and obviously I have my random Gigi's bias, wherever that comes from, <laughs> uh, maybe I just like uh, Garnet and Gray. Who knows? Um, but 
that the, one of the big takeaways from that game was certainly uh, and, and off the top of my head, I imagine that was certainly Quentin Spr- um, uh, Quentin Scott's best out outing on the ground, mm-hmm. right? And a, as we set up, you know, Windsor's defense is such a well-rounded machine. They're only giving up 164 on the ground, which, yeah, is. Oh, just second to a, oh, pardon me, I had that wrong. They're gonna have 132 on the ground, uh, which has them at like top four um, as far as yards given up on the ground. Quinn Springer on the flip side, right, has this out, has this breakout game. On the whole, had a bit of a you know not, not quite uh, as outstanding a year as perhaps that we expected. Obviously, as a whole, they've been leaning way more into the passing outage that they've been able to do. Went Laurie as a team is sitting about six right now in the OUA. Coming off the game against Ottawa, where like we said, put the numbers aside, we do like what Ottawa's been able to do to slow down rushing attacks, a la what they did to slow down Windsor's rushing attack, one of the best rushing teams in the province. Ottawa, Laurie gets theirs with Quentin Scott doing his thing. Despite how good Windsor is as a uh, a, a rush stopping team, as a defensive rush mm-hmm. team, as a mm-hmm. rushing defensive whatever <laughs> word I'm trying to look for there. Come on, brain, work with me here. Um, do you feel like they kind of maybe got some mojo going there? Obviously, in talking about Waterloo, you brought up as the just great football mind you are and f- an offensive line brain of just how schematically maybe Mac put them in some disadvantageous positions. Do you feel like there's certain things that Laurier is doing right now with Quentin, S- Quentin Scott to you know put himself into good positions? And just from what we've seen with Windsor, do you think maybe those could 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 follow true in this game as well and then if so maybe that's perhaps why taylor doesn't get quite the outage that he's been used to if they do say you know what we actually did uncover some things that we can do with uh mr scott and and of course with tanner nelms as well and and, and you know elgersma can get you some yards on the ground too as well so from that standpoint how much of a factor do you think laurier's rushing ability might play into this game as far as taylor's output and just generally with Laurie's offense oh I think it's going to be big I think it, this is going to be a big factor of Laurie's offense certainly you look at obviously what happened this past week against an Ottawa uh, rush defense that I think is very solid as well and Quentin Scott 15 rushes on 194 yards and a touchdown well you look back at last year and Quentin Scott, 20 attempts, 155 yards, and a touchdown mm. against Windsor's defense last year. Now, I think Windsor has gotten a whole hell of a lot better in one year, which is credit to that coaching staff with bringing in the right kind of players and defensive schemes and everything else. But if I'm Quentin Scott. I'm going into this game thinking, hey, I just ran for damn near 200 yards against a very good Ottawa defense. i done a buck 50 on this team just one year ago. I, I think my confidence as Scott is sky high right now. I believe in myself, and I think the team does as well. I, I really think that Quentin Scott has morphed into, not even morphed into, but just has gotten better and better each and every single week to be that standout number one back, with obviously Tanner Nelms being no slouch him, himself as well. But I think the rush ta- attack here for, for Laurier is going to be very pivotal because – while you want to say, you know, I said Western might be the best defense. In actuality, when I'm actually looking at the defensive stats here, um, it's Windsor, it's Laureate, I think Queens, quite honestly, in a lot of these different categories as well. But regardless, uh, you can we can have those kind of debates as a whole. Uh, there's no debating who the sack leader is, and that would be these Windsor Lancers with 26 in this is going into their seventh game. That's insane. And the only way to keep those guys honest and to try to keep Elgersma upright is to keep them honest by running the football. And that's a great point. And what I think is interesting as well is, and, and I'm, I'm curious, I, I don't know if the OUA stats show metrics for, I, I think they do. I'll try and find out maybe as I'm talking for just like how much how much yards through the air sort of per average Laurier is attempting. But, you know, obviously we've spoken so highly and and perhaps no one more so than yourself about not just on Laurier's offense, their receivers in general, but that, you know, that dynamic duo of Ray and Thorne, Ethan Jordan. And of course, if you didn't catch it on our last pod or if you didn't catch the clip that we posted, Mr. Tom Sterling 
crowned uh, Raiden Thorne with having the best hands of in all of you sports. But we certainly, one of the things that's so spectacular about not just Taylor's uh, arm in that it's so it's such a strong arm and he can throw it like at once again. I would love to just like do some kind of a, in the off season be like, you know, what, forget like conventional combine. We're just going to get everyone out of field and be like, who can throw it the furthest? Who can like just kind of like whatever, just some silly things like that. Line up a bunch of trash cans who can get it into the most trash cans from 40 yards away, whatever it would be. But so many of those. So he's got a big arm. And so many of those plays that come to mind when we think about the highlights of Jordan and Thorne are plays that are seemingly 20, if not 30 yards down the field, those sideline catches, which take all the more time going back to your point of how comfortable are you in having Elgersma in the pocket for a prolonged period of time with Kaladi and with Mufta breathing down his neck. So from that regards, I wonder if maybe they change up their scheme a little bit more in how they attack through the air, because I certainly agree. I think they will go to the rushing attack by virtue of just how effective they were last week. And also to your point that it might slow down that passing attack. And I think that same the commentary you had about how Waterloo might attack Carlton rings true in this one. You go after Kaladi. You find number mm-hmm. six and you make that your your point of attack on your rushing plays. Um but th- that piece on just sort of going off of just memory of just what we think about this Laurier passing attack and that it's it is so explosive do they still try and do that with these great pass rushers or do they change it up and if they change it up with the way Windsor can run the ball and maybe chew up the clock and if Skelton's able to put together a good game with Zorn in there does it become a thing where it's like Man, oh man, you know, Laurie is so impressive when they're just like that dr- a couple of those drives against Ottawa where it was like going back to the point you had where Ottawa ends up kicking it to uh, to Laurier late in what was it the, the, the late in the first half mm-hmm. and then and then Laurier is able to drive it right. They can put together these big drives, but a lot of the time that's because of the way they pass it and pass it in that kind of 20 plus 30 plus yardage. Do you think that changes with them as well? Because I certainly agree that the rushing attack will play a, a prominent role, not just from what they found last week, but also to slow down the pass rush. But do you think they'll have to go away from some of those bigger shots or am I reading that wrong and thinking that you know maybe those plays just come to mind because when we see those plays they're normally so fantastic that of course our brain's going to do that thing that like recall a a Laurier passing play okay here's a 40 yard bomb to Mm -hmm. Thor in the back of the end zone he toe taps it in to score a touchdown right that's just so fantastic you think about it if any of that comment seemed sensible in any regards do you have any what do you have to say about that yeah so I think that Knowing who Taylor Elgersma is as a player and uh, the the drive that that kid has in order to want to win games and do whatever he can for his team, you don't get to be the the number one passer in the OUA in terms of yards per game by just taking it easy and just throwing the safe routes. You have it by having a huge arm, having some solid accuracy, and yet having some fantastic deep threats. And he's got all three of those. Even if the coaching staff is calling plays that are designed to be, you know, short to mid range, I'd be shocked if Elgersma doesn't take it himself and try to just bomb it down the field and try to open this up a little bit more. I don't think that that keeps them from doing things of that nature. Maybe, you know, the passing attack or the, the, uh, the rush, the sacks that Windsor has been able to do previously does come into mind here. And maybe they go at that instead of just doing a straight uh, five step drop. Maybe it's, it's a bit of a rollout so that Taylor's already on the run when he's making a throw like that. Or maybe it's, you know, it's a, it's a pump fake to keep the defense honest in that regard. And they just get it. They go at it from a different angle but no, I think that the the deep threat is one of the things that Laurier does the absolute best, and they're going to continue going into that into this game. Yeah, and and I did find the number, and it was much less. Um, I guess it was much less sexy than I thought it would be. I mean, his yards per average is, is nine point four, and I'm assuming it's Evan Hillock's ten point seven that is at the top. Except that I believe, technically speaking, because it doesn't factor in attempts or anything like that. I think Kasim Ferdinand leads the league in yards mm-hmm. per attempt with that 40 yard touchdown that he had to, uh, was it, was it Brown? Whatever it was. I think that was that, that Western game. Um, man, oh man. I, you know, I, if I, 
if I weren't already so excited about this game or like however excited I was going into this conversation, I am that much more amped up about it. Um, I think we've looked at every aspect of this, Tom. I mean, if we want to look at some of the special teams components with like an X factor like Cunningham returning kicks for uh, Windsor. Or on the flip side, Dawson Hodge being, you know, a bit on and off this year uh, with his consistency for a guy that by reputation should be one of the best and just from what he's done is one of the best. Um, We could look at that from that standpoint. But, Tom, I think we got to make picks. And, uh, you know, I put you in a tough spot with uh, with our first game. I can't. Man, Tom, we're we're an hour and five minutes in this podcast and we're still (laughs) finishing up our second (laughs) game. Holy smokes. Um I'll take the honors on this one and, uh, you know, let me just, I'll frame it like this. Um, Windsor is going to be the third seed in the OUA uh, football conference this year because Laurie has taken this one. Windsor wins their last game and whatever happens between Windsor and uh, Western and Laurier can determine one, two, but Windsor will drop this game to Laurier in Waterloo. They'll pick up the game against York and they'll finish six and two, which just think about that. I was trying to do some quick Googling while you were saying a thing to try and find a year that they were remotely close to six and two in recent years. Like maybe it was the Austin Kennedy years, but I don't think they were getting six and two seasons like we were playing during the Austin Kennedy years. They certainly weren't up to that uh, to up to that speed. But once again, Ken Waller, that's your assignment for this pod (laughs) last time that Windsor went six and two. Um but yes, it's it's Laurier at home in this game in what is just man, I like I am so stoked for this game. Tom, who are you picking? A hundred percent. This is this is a game that I've been looking forward to for a very, very long time, like I've said. It this is definitely the longest that I've taken in order to try to look at teams and who I'm who I'm going for here. Uh, but I am going with these Laurier Golden Hawks. I think that the defenses are damn close in terms of how good that they are, and you can de- kind of debate on who's better than who or whatever else. But offensively, I'm certainly going to give the edge to uh, Laurier in this one. I think Elgersma is much stronger of a quarterback than Danny Skelton is, and at the very least, he's proven himself in these big games in order to go off. I think Quentin Scott sees, I think Quentin Scott sees more success on the ground than Christopher John does. If Joey Zorn comes back, that might change things up. But right now, I think Lore's offense is what takes this over the edge. The Golden Hawks come away with this one and go perfect into playing Western in week nine. And Mad Jack Moore gets the showdown that he predicted <laughs> months ago. And yeah, spoiler alert. I mean, I kind of already spoiled it because, yeah, Western's going to win in the blackout game against U of T in this mm-hmm. game. Sorry to cut, to jump the line on that one. But bringing it back to where we're at in our one o'clock slate of games, I'll take us to our next matchup all the way to the nation capital, nation's capital, where your McMaster Marauders are taking on my Ottawa GGs um, <laughs> in a game that's really important, though. You know, this game this game super matters because we have Ottawa right now sitting at 3-3. Three and three. We have Mac sitting at 2-5 and five right now. And Mac, of course, has that head-to-head against Waterloo. They, of course, don't have the head-to-head against U of T. Um, but let's dive into this one. And much like with, I guess it was our question... No, it wasn't our question for this game. Gosh, it's as great as some of the quarterbacks have been. We've certainly had some quarterback questions this year due to injuries. But it's been a question we've had to ask for a number of these teams this year. And for Mac this week, it's certainly no different when it comes to, Tom, who the heck is going to be the quarterback for the McMaster Marauders? Like, what? where do we even start with that? Do you have any insights into even what happened to Keegan? Like, I'm trying to, I don't even remember there being a specific hit he took against Toronto or, or yeah, I guess I guess it would have been against Toronto the week mm-hmm. prior. Like, what what is going on with this Mac offense? He gave us a rundown there, but I mean, do you have do we have any updates, any insights into just where they're at? No insights, no nothing. Uh, uh, the Maroon office has been very tight doors on on this one here, but that's just to uh, you. Yes, specifically to me. And <laughs> maybe maybe they would have been regardless, even if this was common knowledge because of the things that I've said about them on this podcast. But anyways, uh, yeah, I think that's a huge factor going into this one is it's if it's going to be Naranchitz or it's, it's going to be Thalman. Now, obviously, um, I think Naranchitz had a little bit more of the offensive 
uh, plays going into Waterloo, certainly, but he did get injured and Thalman did have to come in afterwards and did a lot better when you're looking at that. Uh, Naranchitz finishes four for 13 for 53 yards against Waterloo and Thalman comes in eight for 11, 85 yards and a touchdown. So even if Steven Naranchitz is healthy, do they still go with Luke depending on what they saw uh, with, with Waterloo here and the, the list of McMaster injuries that they had this past game was uh, impressive to say the least with Jacob Mason being gone. James Priestner, obviously still out Keegan Hall. Like there's, there's a lot of things that this McMaster team would have to put together to see all of these guys come back. And with this being the very last game of the season and seeing, mm, I just don't know. Uh, I don't know who we're going to see. I have no idea. Yeah. And, on the Ottawa side of things, we have much more of a sure thing, right? Yeah. We've seen this assurgence of one Josh Jansen over the last now going into his fourth week, and we kind of, you know, mimicking the comment by the Ottawa play-by-play person of just he starts off his career at a Western homecoming. He's got a Panda game. He's got the team who's now, I think, they're fourth in the nation in the Laurier Gold Knox come to his house, and he almost leads. He's toe-to-toe with them through the first half and almost leads a comeback in the fourth quarter to take that to take that win. And so what's kind of remarkable is on the one hand, in his three games, he sits at one and two, of course, two of those games against top four opponents in the whole country, and he doesn't, he looks like he belongs for every second of it. And of course, this is a MAC team that, that they play defense. They they know how to play defense. Mm-hmm. Don't let the yep. record uh, make you think otherwise. Look at that game again. Look at so many of these games. You know that Waterloo game. Look at that. Even that Guelph game at times. Though that was one of Guelph's better games offensively in certain spouts. Even what they could do against Western in in moments like that. But then you have Amlakar Polk, right? You have Nicholas Gensron, who is just absolutely you know. In your, I don't know, like off the top of my head, I, I feel like he's like, he's certainly top 10, I want to say. Maybe he's kind of in that top eight type position for receivers we have in the league. Um, what, but with, with what they can do in the, in the, in the ground game. But where I certainly, though, see this advantage for my GGs has to be, we talked about some of those holes on Max offense and just these are problems that have gone back to even when they've been at their most healthy. I still don't really get that when they had against Waterloo. Give all the credit to Mac. But once again, don't get fooled by the numbers. I just, this Gigi's defense plays so much better than we would think looking at the numbers and really trying to put my random Ottawa Gigi's bias aside. That is like absolutely where I see the biggest advantage for either of these teams going because Ottawa on offense versus that Mac defense I think will be really entertaining I think that's Mm -hmm. a really great battle we're gonna see Mac's got a really good secondary Josh Jansen slinging it out to all his guys like that Amalekar Polk on the ground Mac's rush defense has been really great just look at what they get did against Waterloo but Ottawa's defense against this Mac offense to me is what looks from where we sit right now something of a of a of a of a tall task to say the least in this one yeah um i'm gonna just go ahead and spoil my pick in this one it's gonna be the ggs so, uh, sorry tom when, you spoiled it two weeks ago when you said you were no longer <laughs> picking mac in games but uh, yeah well just reminding everybody uh i'm going with the ggs in this one but exactly that like at this point, based on everything that we've, Mac sweater. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I I wear this because I'm still a Mac fan. Even though I crap on this team, I'm not afraid to show the colors. So it is what it is, man. Um, but even if Keegan Hall and everybody on that offense is 100 percent healthy, with the way that Josh Jansen has been playing, I still think that the advantage goes to Ottawa in this offense. Certainly on the ground, you look at Amakar Polk. He's He's up there competing with the best of the best in terms of rushing, but the way that Josh Jansen has been playing and the, um, the the receivers and the options that he has for him and how well they have been playing as well is certainly another big factor into that um, going into this one. But even just pulling up the stats for Nicholas Gendron, he's ninth and sixth and the, kind of everywhere uh, in between for a lot of these categories. The one category that he is first 
is yards per catch with 18.8. They go when they hit Gendron, it's for big plays. He's the the big threat down the field for them. And I think he's going to continue to do that and continue to be that threat, or at the very least, take some pressure off of some of those other receivers by being that big threat and keeping Mac honest in this one. I think Josh Jansen and Amlicar Polk really dominate in this game. And they don't I think it's going to be close for the very beginning, for the first half even. I think it's going to be a close game. There's going to be some stuff going back and forth. I still think Ottawa's going to be up by maybe a score or two. But eventually, as it's been the same way with this entire season so far for these Marauders, the defense, while playing lights out, is going to get worn down after two and outs or turnovers or whatever else and eventually start making some mistakes. And that's when Ottawa's going to capitalize here. So look look to be close in the first half, but Ottawa's going to come away with this one. I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like a 35-42 to maybe nothing. Oh, my goodness. That's... <sighs> Wow, that 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 puts my Gigi's fandom to shame a little bit because I wasn't gonna go that <laughs> heavy handed on it. But you know, like you talk about Jen Giron, I mean, obviously we talk about the running attack, but then they also got guys like Maxime Malfon and Kerwin Geist, and you know, Charles Aslan obviously is a, is a great piece of their receiving game too. But you know what? You know, you're throwing out like kind of spicy takes on your your possible score predictions. I'll throw out like a, a bit of a looking into my little crystal ball here, being like Aslan is taking one to the house here because mm-hmm. like. We've seen him come so close in all these games. He's been a great returner for them in their time. You know, obviously, we, you know, with uh, what, oh my goodness, your Mac Punter, why am I forgetting his name? We're talking about him so much all season long. Michael Horvat. Michael Horvat, thank you so much. He certainly has to punt a lot. And Mm -hmm. I see, you know, Charles taking one to the house at one of these in one of these games. I mean, hey, I'm going with my GGs too um, in this game. I just think that advantage is a bit overwhelming. I think they have enough weapons on offense to dilute the the Mac defense where they might want to otherwise perhaps hone in on one thing or the other. And and you said it perfectly when we broke down Week Seven from that game they had against Laurier, where if you try to underestimate or want to sleep on this Gigi's team, like that is the best way to get burnt. And, and, and Max certainly in no position to do so. And I don't think they will. And like last year came down, it was a really nice comeback that Andreas Duick led for them to, to possibly win it at the end of the game. Um, but you know, Oh, like, th- man, Tom, think about it like this. I mean, and I'm not even trying to twist the knife or anything like that because, you know, I know you, you know, you, you got, you, you literally have Mac on your heart right now. You got the jerseys in the background. You got your, your maroon and gray 55 pillows that, you know, shout out to my sister. Um, so, so in the five pillows for us. And obviously Dakota and Nate got their pair in, in team colors as well. As we've said for a while, Mac's got the week nine by. And, no matter, going back to Adam McGuire's call that like, yeah, three and five team will certainly make it. Two and six ain't making it in. I, and once again, I, 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 I hate McMaster. Like, or no, you said it right. It's, it's more a Greg Knox thing, but like, like I, 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 I rarely have a feeling of sympathy, love coach Potasic and all that stuff. And, you know, my guy, Noah Amaral and all these things and, you know, Shout out to Jacob Zott doing his thing. I think he's yeah. still in the CFL. Um, but man, riding back from Ottawa at two and six, no, like it's one thing if, if they if they pick up the win and then as we as we set it up a couple weeks ago, then they could be like, all right, like you tell me, Tom, are they just gonna be in Ron Joyce, like in the locker room watching? Is there a spot in kind of the Westdale community where they'd be like, fellas, we're going to this place where. Wait, I guess you have to you'd have to tell the proprietor of the bar or whatever it is to, hey, do you mind setting up a computer that does OUA? Can you make an account for OUA TV? And then can you plug an HDMI cable into your, yeah, no, it's, it's totally free unless you want to be a new. Unless that happens, which would be an interesting situation, nail biting as though it might be, oh, riding on a bus back from Ottawa, knowing that your season is now a week, is finished a week earlier. That, that does make me a little... It's sad to think, even though I am taking the scenario in which that will very much be the case in, you know, two days and a half, two and a half days from where we sit right now. 
I don't know. Certainly. No, it's it's that's a hell of a thing to do. Um, going back after a, a loss to Ottawa is a very, very, very long drive. And especially in this kind of scenario here. But, you know, the, hopefully you take a good, hard, hard, good, long, hard look at yourselves in the mirror and you say, this was this is on you guys. You know, this is. For as much as I want, I no, I didn't. I don't even want to say like because I've enjoyed no no part in crapping on McMaster this year. Uh, but you were in almost every single game that you played in this year. You had a legitimate shot to win each and every single game, and you're going to finish. We think two and six. You're not. It's not hopeless. There's still more things that can be dug going into next year, but. You're close, and you've missed the playoffs three years in a row. Time to time to change some things up. That's all I'll say. On a positive note or on a note that kind of makes my stomach turn multiple times over is that if Mac wins this game, they have the week nine buys. We said Ottawa plays Queens in their last game which is certainly going to be a tough game. And I'll certainly let the the week's eight games influence how I feel about that matchup. And we're about to talk about Queens in a second. There is a reality, and pardon me while I almost vomit in my throat, where <laughs> Mac and Ottawa are both three and five at the end of the year, and Mac has the head, head advantage. <laughs> oh, my uh- God. Uh, I don't even want to think about that. Oh, oh, yeah. And then the, oh, oh, God, no. Okay, no, we're taking Ottawa. This game's to bed, <laughs> as are the uh, as are the McMaster Marauders. See you next year. Oh, God. Anyway, let's go on to our next game. As we said, it involves the Queen's Golden Gales. They're heading to the Royal yeah. City to take on the Guelph Griffins. My Ottawa GGs, the Guelph Griffins. I'm all over the place. My room's decked out in Guelph gear. Cats and dogs living together. What on earth is going on? <laughs> Guelph, much like Western and Windsor, coming off the week seven bye. Queens coming off of that nice victory at home against the Carlton Ravens. Here's the big question for me. Number one, how healthy is, is Guelph? Or I guess a couple questions. How healthy is Guelph? That's been the question all year long. Yep. It, it's you know it's it's worth noting that as entertaining Guelph as that little video you put up, miking up Anakin Guthrie at practice was, and he seems like a very nice young man. Worth noting that in the midst of that video, he's like, "Hey, there goes Tuzo r- running around the track. He just <laughs> runs and runs and runs." I would have much preferred if he was wearing pads and on the football field <laughs> practicing. So clearly, at least at that time, like it's one thing if it's like he's wearing a, well, I guess the offense wears red and defense wears black in practice. If he's wearing a yellow jersey, it's one thing if that. It's another thing. He's literally just running laps. So that's not great. Nope. But on the other hand, Queens is no stranger to having injury trouble themselves. So let me set it up like this. You have Guelph who has had one of the more porous rushing defenses, even when they've been more healthy. We see that first outing against Windsor, and obviously that was before they made the changes to that kind of more um, uh, Coach DC style, um, Donovan Carter style uh, approach to defense and everything like that with the 3-4. But then Waterloo still gets theirs and droves against them. But... My So my question becomes, because I guess you could kind of say the answer is that Waterloo game. Can Queens do what they did against Carlton and ostensibly beat this Guelph team? What did they pass it? Was it six times that Russell Weir threw it? Six, nine times? It was less than ten. Is that defense, is that rushing attack good enough? To win them this game. We obviously threw out that question sort of broadly. Can Queens with that? Because this rushing attack is great. This Mm -hmm. defense is great. Maybe that can't get them out of Ontario. I think it can get them out of Guelph with a win though. How do you feel about that? The short answer is yes. That that, that Queens rush is good enough. That they could do a similar game plan here. And probably come away with a win. Especially... 
with how bad Guelph has been stopping the run. For whatever reason, they just have not been able to put things together here in order to try and stop the run. I mean, you look at rushing yards per game. Uh, the York Lions are the worst at 305. The Guelph Griffins are second worst at 230. 230 rushing yards per game. That's been the biggest thing for the past couple of years now with Guelph is that they've really struggled to stop the run. And Jared Kasari and Anthony Souls really seem to be right back to where they were last year in terms of being at the top of their game. And that Carlton game, like we said before, I think that um, Jared Kasari has the best eyes, the best vision of any running back in the OUA right now. Like he was really, really impressive here. So yeah, I think this Queens rush rushing attack is going to be just as effective this, this week. Yeah. And frankly, like, cause I, I, I still am of the belief we're not seeing Vreekin this week. I, I do not like you. I, I will, you know, I'll happily clip myself saying this. If we do see him trot out there and, and I'll look silly I mean, if if for no other reason than the fact that it was against Guelph that James Keenan got hurt last year, yep. that you're just like, no, 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 no. We're like, <laughs> if Reekin's ready to go, you're like, eh, maybe we give you some reps against Ottawa next week. <laughs> so, but so on the other hand, though, because looking at Guelph's offense, because I, despite having moments where they've sputtered at times. Bit of injury trouble as like as they've had all across the board. Like once again, if you replay this Guelph season like ten times, and uh, that assuming that maybe they're healthier sometime around, man, from what we've seen from them and the talent they have there, this could be a team that I mean I still don't think it, those deficiencies in their rushing defense get cleaned up. But this is a team that's in the upper third of the OUA, upper, you know, maybe fighting for a, a, a six and two season and things like that. And we, we've definitely seen, you know, some really positive things out of Tristan Abood. We've seen Marshall McRae when they kind of bring him as that wildcat when Abood went down um, against Waterloo. We obviously saw McRae do things really well. Once again, I don't have an update on that. I don't know if you have an update on Abood status or an update on uh, Vishon Janusis' status, because that was the big thing coming out of that Waterloo game, I I felt, was that, you know, it's one thing for them to have gotten run over, because we saw that already against Windsor. Waterloo has a great rushing attack. We kind of expected that might happen. But Janusis, we saw go out against Mac, I believe it was in that, no, or it was against York, I believe it might have been in that game. He was against York, yep. York, he gets dinged up. Abood goes out against in the Waterloo game, and just mm-hmm. that not that McCray can't be a great quarterback. I think he he has the, all the makings of it and everything like that. But how that diminishes the full scope of your offense when you can't say Abood's our guy. We bring in McCray as this kind of like change of pace guy to really throw you off your stuff. And whoever's that quarterback, not having their top receiver in Janusis is certainly a problem for them. Donovan Malloy has been exceptional all season long. Mm-hmm. But once again, whatever you make of those injuries, if Abood and um, Janusis are in that, heck, if somehow Isaiah Smith, you know, does the, you know, the the Ray Lewis deer antler spray thing and like he's somehow like perfectly healed or you put him in the hyperbaric chamber or the 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 the, the Dragon Ball Z version that we referenced, <laughs> um, they're going against this Queens defense. That's pretty freaking good whether they're at their quote unquote most healthy they can be on offense or what's even worse if it's still McCray at quarterback, which once again isn't a shot at McCray, is just a function that I think this offense is at its best this year when he's coming in as that curveball, as that change up to a boot. However they are looking against this Queen's defense, what do you see them the the manifesting? Well, this is a Queen's defense that first in the OUA in yards per game, first in the OUA in rushing yards per game Mm. at 87. 
and they've played against some pretty damn good teams so far already. It's not like they're just playing against, you know, the Torontos, the Yorks, the McMasters of the world um, and padding those stats. They are, this is, this is legit. This Queens team, this Queens defense is damn good. And their strength is stopping the strength of Guelph. I think right now on paper, this Queens team is so well suited to take out these Guelph Griffins. Yeah. They can't stop the run Guelph and <laughs> Queens, if nothing else, can ru- run the ball like like anybody can. And their number one thing that Guelph can do is run the ball. And that's the best thing that Queens is good at in terms of stopping it. And even passing yards per game, they're only at third. So this Queen's defense is damn, damn good. And uh, unless we see like a complete overhaul or some real unbelievable plays from Guelph, man, I just, I don't see, I don't see the Griffin's offense really doing a lot in this game. No. And once again, this is a perfect example of like, and and like, so I'll, I'll I'll start us off. Not then I I still have some other thoughts. I want to say like Queens is winning this on the road and I think it could be ugly. I mean, I'll, I'll make a little, I won't say correction, but I'm going to alter what you said a little bit where you're like, Queens runs the ball as well as anybody in this league. As we're getting down to the last two weeks here, the fact of the matter actually might be no one in the league runs the ball as well as Queens. They are, have become the standard. And we've seen that flip-flop from Windsor being the top dog to Waterloo taking over for a little bit. Queens, and all the while, it's always, regardless of who it is at the top, (laughs) Western somehow always kind of in second and just being like, (laughs) hey, once again, we get it, Western. You're really damn good at football. I get it. I get it. Um yeah, I think this could be I think this could be ugly. And like once again, part and parcel with that rushing attack, read it off earlier in talking about Waterloo, but Queens chews up a lot of clock playing the way that they do. And as you said, whether McCr- whether Abood and and uh, uh, Janusis are healthy, Guelph's best thing they got going offensively is still Donovan Malloy. And if you're getting down a couple scores and having to say, well, let's keep feeding Malloy. Yeah, he can bust a big one, but he's not going to be busting a big one against Queens on defense. I, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I think this, I think this could get, could go south. Um, it, it's Queens on the road for me. We don't need to stop the conversation there. If there's other um, sort of points of, of, uh, of interest for you in this one, but that's certainly where I'm going on this. Yeah. Well, uh wanted to just take a look at things um from a uh you know an offensive rushing standpoint mm. third in the OUA would be these Guelph Griffins uh just over a thousand yards on the ground 1082 216 per game and seven touchdowns nothing to sneeze at nope nope first Queens Golden Gales 1,400 yards on the ground, 243 per game with 17 touchdowns coming on the ground this year alone. The the heart... Wait, what? 17 touchdowns on the ground. That's what it says on the OUA website. <laughs> Western and Laurier tied for second with 10. What? That's stupid. Yeah. So this Queens team really runs the ball really well. And uh, yeah, they they run this for a uh, a big old dub in the Royal City. I'm <laughs> and I just blow your mind a little bit I'm, there. Uh, yeah, I'm I am. Uh, this is this is me literally being speechless. That's remarkable. In six games, they have 17 rushing touchdowns. Um, hey, I yeah, no, I, I honestly like I like that was a great back and forth we had talking about the Waterloo Carlton game and just being able to spell out both sides of it. Laurier and Windsor being able to spell out both sides of it. And I even feel like that Mac Ottawa. Well, no, you felt you feel like that Mac Ottawa game is gonna be a little one sided as well. I certainly, you know, I'm not as apprehensive on that one. This one, I don't 
And once again, I'll happily clip myself saying this right now and post it and tag Guelph and tag Queens and all this. I don't know the pathway to victory for Guelph in this game. This is such a and you know and maybe, and maybe we're getting to the point where we said it against Carlton that wow you know Queens is really a bad matchup for you in this one and we're saying this one wow you know what Guelph Queens is just a bad matchup for you in this one and that Ottawa team is going to be a different story but when you say that enough times that X team is just a bad matchup for any given team it gets to a point where you just say yeah. They're just really good. And you mentioned that rush defense. As you said, they've played Western. They've played Windsor. They've played Laurier. What? Yeah. All right. That's we're, yep. we're done. Are we done? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think we're done. Let's move on to the nightcap of the game. And this is not just any nightcap. This game happens to be taking place in the Forest City. If you don't know where that is, that is London, Ontario. And when there's a night game in London, Ontario, because that's where the Western Mustangs play, it normally means it's the blackout game. And this year's victim for the blackout game, because I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but Western, I don't think, well, they don't really lose football games to begin with, so it's kind of a moot point, but specifically when they trot out under the lights at Western Alumni Stadium, I think they actually recently renamed it, I apologize for not knowing exactly what that is. When they trot out under the lights there in London on a Saturday night, I think once it was a Friday night not too long ago, in those all-black uniforms, you can take every dollar in your bank account and bet it on purple or black, I guess in this case. (laughs) It's Western hosting U of T, 7 o'clock start, kickoff, I should say, in London. We kind of joked that, ironically, both these teams are going to be looking past one another on the schedule. And I'm kind of all right with that because <laughs> Western's <laughs> looking at Laurier the following week and Toronto's looking at Waterloo the following week. Obviously, if things go the way you predict with the uh, the Waterloo-Carlton game, that's going to be a Waterloo team that is fighting just to sneak back into that 3-5 and five territory. If it goes the way I am I had kind of called it, that's a Waterloo team that can say, oh my God, we can go 4-4 four and four this year. But put that aside, I can't wait to just like just gush about with a week 9 games knowing the final standings or knowing the standings going into it when we get there. Honestly, what I'm the most curious about in this one, and when it comes down to where we end up, who we end up getting as our OUA MVP, not for nothing, hey, uh, Laurier didn't get a chance to to pad them stats against York. And obviously, uh, you know, I forget what the numbers were that, uh, you know, you know, one Mr. Evan Hillock did against York in week one, but it was pretty bad as far as just like the beatdown he put on them. We're going to be going into that week nine matchup because, as we said, we both pick Laurier against Windsor. Windsor's defense is, at the worst, second, right in that midst, top yep. third at the very least. There's some great defenses this year. His numbers will probably be come down a little bit from that 320 wherever he's at. Or maybe they won't, in which case we might just have to crown him then and there if he puts <laughs> up like 350 yards against Windsor. But knowing that there's that final matchup of the season where we're getting Hellock and we're getting Elgersma, it might come down to something of being like, whoever wins that game is your MVP. And right yeah. here and now is Western's chance. It comes down to like this. You know, you get often a blowout game and you say, all right, we go to our rushing attack a little bit more. We don't need to take these shots. I I kind of have a hunch with just all the pageantry of the night game, with the narrative of Evan being the MVP, we got a sta- a night stage, a Saturday night of Elgersma doing his thing in Ottawa, all the province watching and tuning in. Under the, so you flip that script now, night game in London with Western against an inferior opponent. I think they might say, I'm so sorry, U of T, it's not you. It's them, and by them, I mean Laurier and who they got quarterback. And Evan, I think, might throw it for like 35 times in this game. 
that that's like and i'm sure there's other things too that's like the most interesting thing i have to say about this one is just like i i do think that western is gonna kind of put it on uft a little bit here what, what, what are you thinking with this matchup yeah i can tell you that um those kind of things do matter to these to these western mustangs and looking at those stats and that um i can tell you that when we played against them in 2015, the very uh, last game of the season, uh, we played against them, and they beat us pretty handily that year in the regular season. But Asher Hastings was two touchdowns away from breaking the U Sports touchdown record in the regular season, and he got that. And the look of anger on Coach Marshall's face, you would have thought that we beat them by 40 points. He hated every second of that. He did not want us to get that record. And so that's certainly something that he's looking at here. So, yeah, I really wouldn't be surprised if Evan goes for uh, some really big numbers in this Toronto game. Um, Now, when you look at the stats, uh, Toronto has four pick sixes. So (laughs) simmer down. Yeah. Simmer down. Uh, listen, this is this is all Western all the time. And I think, once again, when you're taking a look at this, there's a lot of things that you can do that can hinder you uh, or this can turn into a, a false positive really quickly here. I think Western just sticks to what they've been doing before. And if anything, and like you said, you really don't want to look ahead games, but this is a prep game to make sure that after the bye week, they're completely tuned up, ready to go, completely focused for Laurier and what'll be you know and it's fascinating because you know it, yeah like the, there's like we said if if Windsor if Windsor pulls out the victory and then, then well then no it's still then it, they could still both be seven and one that yeah the Windsor winning ones the one that still baffles me of what happens there so you know what I'm gonna move away from that one I moved away from it the first time I'm gonna move away from it again but how Windsor and obviously, Western's going to do what all teams do. They're going to go to the tape, and, and especially the most recent tape. But sometimes you sometimes you want to go to an opponent that has a similar mojo to you, right? So sometimes it's the most recent team because you want to see the most recent iteration of, in this case, what Laurie is doing offensively and defensively to be able to scheme it up for them. And in 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 Western's case too, your you know your your, your goal is staying healthy. Your goal is maybe you know padding Evan stats a little bit, which like. I'll kind of admit, I feel like Laurier's taking that approach with Taylor at certain times of being like, nah, kid, keep throwing it, man. And 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 whether that's for whatever reasons, I I, I just I, I do feel that watching their game sometimes. I don't, I don't I'm not I'm not saying that from a point of negativity. I just, you know, mm-hmm. hey, let's go win our kid a, an MVP, right? I think what's gonna be fascinating is they can not only watch the film of Windsor and Laurier as the most recent game of what Laurier's putting on film, but also being able to look at how they did against a Windsor team that shows a lot of similarities to what Western does to be able to mm-hmm. say, you know, because sometimes you might see it. You might go to an older game and be like, maybe we do a lot of three by two on offense. So let's go back to a week two matchup because the team did that. Or, hey, this team plays a fi- like a, a five man front a lot. And and we, you know, and that's what we do. But that was in a game way ago. So we're going to watch that one because specifically. So that'll be that much more interesting where not only will Western be, I think, just putting Evan and Hillock to have the most success, they're going to be able to watch that Windsor Laurier game to see a something of a facsimile of how they play football themselves in Windsor, attacking Laurier in victory or defeat in that game to be able to then see, okay, I get it. And that game will have already finished up too. So like if, if Windsor, like if Joey Zorn is back, or even if he's not back, and because like that offensive line is great for Windsor, somehow we're talking about the Windsor Laurier game again. This is my fault. My apologies. <laughs> but like if they're still able to run the ball on them um, by hook or by crook, then maybe it's like, all right, hey, we know. All right. Okay, cool. Like we're going to, we're going to run it on them. And that's where maybe our key success against Laurie is going to be, or, or, you know, wh- whatever might happen anyways. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a fascinating matchup. Um, just to see once again, what, um, just what Western's going to do in preparation for this. I mean, for like for U of T, like we said, on the flip side, they certainly are more interested in their game against Waterloo the following week. And I think I kind of asked you this last week, but even against a team like Western, where 
Like, it's so funny to think of the idea of U of T using this game against Western as a practice for a game against Waterloo. <laughs> but, I, you know, just from what we've seen over the last couple of weeks, it's the Scott Barnett show now. Adam Williams, Lucas Stoikos in the backfield. Not all that much kind of happening yet there. Like, really, any success they have had has been on the back of them getting, as you alluded to, six defensive turnover uh, touchdowns this year, which g- you give them credit for, absolutely. But I, I, I don't think you can say like, hey, if there's one thing UFT does well, they score defensive touchdowns. Like it is what they've done well, but that's not so you don't necessarily I think like give them credit for. I don't know, man. What like yeah. maybe I'm just milking like something out of this game for interest when when I don't have to. What well, you, you you speak now, Tom? I I'm. Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was more so poking a little bit of fun at the fact that uh, not poking fun at Toronto, mainly at my Marauders, because I think all four of those pick sixes came against McMaster in that one game. Uh, so, yeah, while Toronto is very good at obviously uh, turning the ball over and getting some some points, they did most of that, if not all of that, against my Marauders. So I don't think that that's going to be the case once again in this game. However, here... We spoke about it a little bit in the last, uh, in the review pod, but for Toronto, I think this is them doing their best in order to get up and get ready for Waterloo, that they're going to be playing the week after as well. I think going into this game, you're going to finish uh, with another loss. You'll be at two and five. If you can manage a win against Waterloo and be at three and five, providing that Waterloo is also at three and five, there's a lot of interesting dynamics there in terms of how things can work out. And this Toronto squad has a legitimate chance of getting into the playoffs. Now, a lot of other things need to happen there. It's not just win against Waterloo and you'll be in, but certainly for them to even qualify for that, they'll have to beat those Waterloo Warriors. So going into this game here, Obviously, nobody goes into this thinking, oh, my God, like this is going to be a blowout, whatever. They're obviously still going to do whatever they can in order to try to win this game. Western is going to win this spoiler. But um, I think that we'll start to see a very similar game plan to what we will see against these Waterloo Warriors um, and seeing about how they can kind of work the kinks out. If Scott Barnett can throw the ball 17 times and not turn the ball over against Western, that's a huge step in the right direction for this Toronto team to kind of be competitive against a uh, good Waterloo squad as well. So interestingly enough, like you kind of pointed out, both of these squads kind of looking to next week, obviously Western hoping that they can be uh, still undefeated. And I would even say... I know, I know the look, I know, but I would even say Western hoping that Laurier can stay undefeated oh, as well okay. so that both of these squads can be 7-0 and going to it um, into the last game. And Toronto obviously wanting to sort some things out and figure out something of a solid game plan so that they can go into Waterloo and see about getting a big W there and getting into the playoffs as well. I, if they're, okay, they're, yeah, no, I, totally. And just once again, thinking about where the standings might wind up, there's a very realistic possibility that the final, that there could be six teams with three and five records. And you could have, you could, it, it could come down to this. You could have, you could, <laughs> this would be the most bizarro, like OUA <laughs> sc- c- like standings, but it's very possible. You could have Western Laureate seven and one at the top. You could have Windsor and Queens at six, pardon me, at five and three in that three, four, uh, three, four mm-hmm. spot there. Then six teams at three and five, and then New York Lions at 0 and seven. And once again, <laughs> I would be over the moon with how I, how that would make me feel about the OUA if that were the case right there. <laughs> Whether that all happens, that's yet to be seen. Tom, I can't imagine you have much else to say about this game. No, correct? no, it's it's Western. It's Western big. It's a night game. It's, uh, yeah. And you know what? Perhaps the most interesting thing about this game, if I can be moderately self-aggrandizing, is contrary to something I said on a pod or two ago. <laughs> not only might I be there, despite what I said about not being there, Tom... 
I might be there as well. Ah! <laughs> so exciting. We might be there for the blackout game. Um, of course, if you're going to be there too, um, come say what's up. And um, yeah, let's just talk OUA football because uh, we certainly enjoy doing that. And uh, if you're listening to this, I imagine you do as well. That'll wrap up our preview podcast for week eight in the OUA. Tom, just any last thoughts, comments, questions, theories, feelings on anything that you have you want to share with the fine folks been tuning in for us uh, with us all season long well first and foremost uh just a uh, a massive amount of appreciation for everyone who has been tuning in to us uh throughout this entire season here uh commenting with us asking us your questions we so appreciate it every single listener that we have here it really is outstanding and we can't thank you enough for that Talking about this specific week here, um, the one thing that I do wish, and it's a general wish that I wish every year that never seems to come true, but I wish that injuries didn't play a factor in terms of how well a team can do or can't do. I wish that everybody would just stay completely healthy and we could see the best of the best each and every single week. But obviously that's not the case. I hope that every single person who was maybe on the bubble gets a chance to come back into this game and to, to showcase what they have because going into the end of the season here, obviously you want to own your own destiny and do whatever you can. So I wish nothing but the best for each and every competitor here. And man, oh man, can I not wait to see these games. Hoo-wee! This is going to be a great week, my friend. It, it, it always is, and it's even better when I know I get to chop it up with you after it's all <laughs> said and done. But just to recap, we have Carlton and Waterloo, a game where we, you and I have so rarely went on other sides of the spectrum on these games, but I think for all the right reasons. We mm-hmm. have Windsor and Laurier in a game that we've been looking forward to to weeks on end. We have Mac going to Ottawa. Ottawa looking to send Mac packing not just for the week but for their entire season queens rolling into guelph and possibly through and over the griffins on their way to maybe a five and three season and toronto and western where oddly both these teams are looking forward to their week nine matchup perhaps a little bit more than that current game that they have in store for them as we said there's a good chance me and Tom are going to be live and direct in London to check out that Western UFT game so once again if you're there come give us a shout Tom I can't wait to see how all these games play out as he said thank you to everyone tuning in being on this journey on this ride with us however it is you're tuning in and consuming our content thank you just as always for doing so so Tom we have a great slate of football games leading us into the final week of action can't wait to be talking about with talking about it with you later on this week right here at the 55.